All right, I'm clicking record. All right, we're recording now. All right, I want to welcome everybody. Um, I'm Millie, and this is our, our first international Zoom meeting, right, Andy? We've had yes, some I local believe ones. it is. The first international, because we have our speaker from Great Britain, and I have my grandchildren on from Germany. And uh, I want to thank Andy for putting all the technology together for today. And, and we did a little test and seems fine. And we are indeed indebted to Nick, who's in, agreed to do this presentation for us. And I'm not going to steal his thunder, but I think that he's going to tell us a lot about, oh, well, I should say that we've also invited some um, other chapters, our good friends from our mini assembly, the Upper Chesapeake uh, chapter, the Delaware chapter, and the Susquehanna chapter, and some other uh, WCHA leaders who may be joining us as you'll check the, um, the participants. Um, and I'm going to be monitoring the chat room. So if you have chats, you can put things in there because we don't, we don't want to interrupt uh, Nick as he's doing his presentation. But we are having time for real-time questions at the end, we hope. And at the top of the chat room to everybody, I put my email and a cell phone number also that you could use for communication. All righty. Now with that, I'm handing it over to Nick. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, present to you. I would have met some of you in Peterborough um, two years ago now, and then um, before that, the previous two years ago at Paul Smith's. Um, what I'm going to do is run through. So that, that's us um, that you can hopefully see on the screen. Um, <laughs> them. <laughs> us, and, us and them now uh, from the uh, 31st of um, December. The blue dot is me. So that's where I am in the eastern part of, of the UK. This, this is the eastern um, area here and I'm based up here in Norfolk. Um, there's the UK as a whole. That, that's an interesting map for everybody to look at. Um, you can see S Scotland is green. So that means that the Scots people can paddle where they like. In the rest of England and Wales, there's very little green, there's more red. And the red means that there is no agreement there for people to paddle those waterways. And so we have to negotiate access. There are some green areas, but it's a, a, an ongoing battle at the moment that people are, are trying to negotiate agreements um, for people to be able to paddle freely. Uh, it's, it's difficult and we have the terminology navigation. If there's been historical navigation, then whoopee do, we can go and paddle it, but you've got to prove it. Yeah. Um, what I do with the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association in the UK, I put us under the umbrella of the Open Canoe Association, which you, you can see here. The reason I do that is twofold. One, I get insured um, as, as a group because you've got to have your third party liability insurance. Um, and I can therefore fall under the Open Canoe Association umbrella, which falls under the British Canoeing association so i'm affiliated to the open canoe association in my presentation you will see as well as a lot of nice wooden canoes you will see a lot of plastic canoes and the reason that i combine with the open canoe association is that if you try and sell a wooden canoe to a member of the wooden canoe heritage association they go well i've already got one whereas if you go to someone who's into plastic boats they go hmm quite like that so that's the way to push your membership um, and so I do a lot of joint events and uh, you know there's a classic example of Joy in a plastic mad river having a nice look at Sam's old town. Um, Millie asked me I think to talk about kit. I think kit is pretty standard wherever you paddle. Um, one of these should be like wearing the seatbelt in the car, I think, nowadays. Uh, a lot of people don't like wearing them, but it will save your life. Uh, and if I was to post a photograph on any canoeing website in the UK 
with someone paddling without one of these, I would get absolutely pilloried, and so would the person who's in the photograph, um, because it is really bad form not to wear a buoyancy aid. Um, you'll also need to take that. That's my license. So on the waterways that I can paddle, I have to have a license. That also gives me quite a few million pounds worth of third party liability insurance. Uh, for, in your money, $50, it's cheap. Um, and whenever I've been coaching children and they want to go on to own their own kayaks, go on, go on, go on, go on. Um, I'll say to them, please, you know, join the British Canoeing Association because then you will be insured. Um, part of the kit I carry is, um, you can see the good old whistle, um, but I also carry that little gadget there. Um, in the UK, um, we're not allowed to carry knives. This knife here, little pocket knife, is illegal in the UK because the blade is three and a quarter inches long. A quarter of an inch makes all the difference. Yeah. And it used to be that you would see people flouncing around in their buoyancy aids with big old knives stuck on the front. Uh, that will scare children, it will scare pregnant women, and you just can't do it. Uh, you have to have a reason. So I carry that, which is a rope cutter. Uh, it is razor sharp. You can't cut your finger on it, but it will get you out of a situation if you need to cut a rope. Uh, and it's safe. Other, I carry two bags with me when I go out paddling. This is a Cabalas Thought bag. Um, you'll see in there, there's my license. I carry a saw, a simple folding saw. Um, because we'll often find branches down. And if you can make it clear for someone else, that's fine. Standard wooden canoe repair kit, bit of uh, paracord, gaffer tape or duct tape. Um, map, a couple of mobile phones, because that one will fail quicker than that one. Um, batteries don't like cold and they don't like wet. Uh, sunglasses, leather mantle, um, which you, you can do anything with that. Um, map and I've always carried one of these which is a climbing sling because all too often uh, you might end up having to tow someone a climbing sling um, is relatively expensive to buy put it on a great big carabiner put a cork float on it because you don't want to lose it um, but you can do anything with that you can lash two boats together you can tow someone uh, it's a great bit of kit uh, and I always take it with me and the other two things that I carry are a couple of cameras. People always say to me, oh, you take great photographs. Well, I use a camera. You know, too many people try and take a photo with that, with a mobile phone, and end up with a picture of that. Um, it's not too difficult. I first started off with this little Pentax waterproof camera. Uh, and now I've moved up to an interchangeable lens waterproof camera. Um, that is an, a Nikon. Nikon One, which unfortunately they've, they've stopped producing, but completely waterproof and has interchangeable lenses. Um, sometimes I'll carry these. Let's say the bottom one is illegal, the top one isn't, strangely enough. Um, I can carry an axe, but I can't carry a penknife because with an axe you are going for a purpose. I'm probably going to cut a tree down or cut some kindling or whatever. Uh, waterproof. Kit bags for wallet, car keys, although I tend to always keep my car keys tucked into my buoyancy aid because I always want those on me. You know, when you're seeing your bag disappear down the river and you know your car keys are in it, it's uh, not, not very handy. Um, tilly hat, you know, you can't be a canoeist and not have a hat. Um, and the great thing with that is it comes with beer money tucked in the secret pocket inside. Um, <laughs> And then my day pack um, that I carry as well. In that, I will simply have a, a, a wet, a, a dry bag that will have a change of clothing in it. Um, there will be um, a flask, perhaps some snacks, just stuff that you need for a day trip. Um, simple things. And I think it's probably similar wherever people will take stuff for the day. You don't have to take too much with you. You just need to be safe. There will always be a, um, a wind cheater in there, a kegel, uh, because the weather will change here within minutes. 
Um, and, you know, I don't, you can, you can always be warm paddling, but, but you can never be warm and wet. So if you can keep yourself dry, it's great. And I'll take a compass occasionally, but I don't really need that because I've got a map and I always know where I am. Uh, I know which direction I'm going. Um, you know, because the waters aren't that big. And strangely enough, because we're on navigation, they put signposts up, which are very handy. Hmm. Um, and I'll, it's always a joke with my friends that Nick will always carry bits of rope. You know, you can always do a lot. So I'll take that as a, a another, uh, there's 25 meters of uh, cord in there, which is a great, um, you know, you can't have enough rope really. Okay, so looking at where we paddle, this is the area of the UK in the eastern section where I live now. Uh, it's the Norfolk Broads. It's called Britain's Magical Waterland. It is made up, and if I can enlarge the screen for you, you can see all these large lake areas that are the Broads, connected by various rivers, uh, drainage dikes, etc. cetera. Um, and these were uh, medieval peat diggings that they dug them for, for the peat, for fuel, uh, and over time they got flooded. Um, and it is, some of, it is the best flat water paddling in the UK. Here's um, an example of one of the trips that, that we do. Um, you will see the word pub appearing um, because on navigation we have pubs. Um, the finish point in Norfolk tends to be uh, at a centre on the north edge of Barton Broad that I use. Um, it's an outdoor activity centre who welcome adults rather than children. Um, we camp there um, and we have it as a base because it is centrally within the Norfolk Broads. But this would be a typical um, day paddle here. That, would, that route from the two start points would be four hours four or five hours with, you know, and you can add in some stops there. Because when you're route planning, you've got to really look at who your group are, what they're capable of, and the trips have to be long enough to be interesting, but short enough not to be a chore. If you get it wrong, it becomes a slog. Um, and you've also really got to keep an eye on the weather and be prepared to change your plans. You know, I'm quite happy to do that, that you look and you say, right, we'll either call it off or we'll change the venue, depending which way the wind's blowing. Um, there's another route there. That one uh, is a beautiful section of river, and I'll show you the photographs in a minute. Um, but it starts off right up. I'm pointing at the screen with a pen and realise I need to use this. Um, up here, it is a very narrow little river, but these are mills that we have to portage. So these are old mills that would have been used for flour. Um, and, you know, there's a stop here in the middle at Colshill because there's pubs and it's quite nice. We're, you know, it's civilised. There's, if there's pubs, you know, the law in the UK is if there's a pub, you've got to stop. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's rude not to. It, it's there for, to be used. Um, th this one could take quite some time on this trip because there's one, two, three, four pubs on that trip. Um, <laughs> but it is some wonderful bits of river there um, that varies that you can dip off the river onto the broads. Um, we stop down here. This, this is a good lunchtime stop. But again, that is a five hour paddle. Um, this one again, this is that the centre here at Barton Broad that I was talking about and we can um, go off the broad, up the river Ant, and we can split to Dillham, or we can go further up uh, to a picnic spot at Honing at the top there. Again, that is, in terms of distance, round trip, about 11 miles. So it's a, it's a good outing, and you, you know you've done it. Um, when we go away, this is the kit I take um, and camp up at the base. When I first used to start, I, di I didn't have bunting it's only when i got married that bunting suddenly arrived um you know here um but i like to sleep under canvas and we set up a central base so we don't carry it um and we take a mixed group because it's all about being social and people um learning 
from each other, really, that it's peer pressure um, in terms of teaching. We have coaches of various levels um, and you'll have youngsters who come in. You know, Molly here started when she was a 10 year old with us and has stayed with us um, and, and loves paddling with the group. And then we can dine in at the center. One night I'll have a group meal, which will allow everybody to meet up uh, one evening. And then you can imbibe in what you like, which makes the evening or other evenings we'll, we'll camp out. And I always take a group shelter um, and you know, get people to socialize. And all in all, it's, it's a good group. So this is a start point on one of the trips at Barton Broad, this is a stave. Uh, the stave that we have, each village would have had its own stave that um, is there for boating and recreation. Some stathes are open to the public, others are just restricted to the people who live in that particular village. So part of my job has been to try and go out and negotiate access for people to use the stathes. And you can start off there. Um, some of them you can moor up, but not take a boat out. Others you can launch uh, and paddle away from. And this is the a typical Broadland River. Um, it will go from the River Ant, which we were on, into this beautiful little canal. Uh, and it's a disused canal that I've been working with the team there. It's slowly getting restored back and my aim is to get a canoe route uh, right from the top um, through. Two years ago, they had an open day and I was there talking to one of the organizers who said to me, look, he said, I've got a photo of a hundred years ago of someone sailing a canoe down this canal. I would love to replicate that. And on the open day there, I managed to take my cedar rib canoe, put the sailing gear on it and I paddled it up to the top of the canal. And in that evening, I managed to paddle, um, to sail it a, a mile and a half back for him. So, you know, it was a 110 year old canoe um, paddling down the canal. And that's the canal that's been restored that you've just seen people paddling on. Uh, the section that we were just looking at was that bottom section here. This section, we're negotiating access on here. This section is rewatered and this section is about to be rewatered. So the aim is to try and get a canoe route from there all the way through to here. And then this at the bottom leads into the larger network of waterways. Um, and this again is the canal. It's a private canal. We have to pay to go on that one and it's two pound a head, which is good value for a day's entertainment really. And you can see it varies considerably how they used to get great big wherries up there carrying goods, I do not know, but it would have been a lot wider. It's, it's got overgrown over the years. And again, a mixed group of people. Uh, this is at the Tonnage Bridge, where they would have worked out the weight of the, the, the barges and wherries going up the canal um, in the early 19th century. And that's right at the top of the canal that was. Um, Again, the larger rivers, this is a section of larger river on the broads, um, showing a, a typical stave again, where we're allowed to, this one, we can tie up to it, but we can't get out at it. Um, again, a selection of Broadland uh, pictures. This is up on the upper Bure, where they were all the mills. Uh, pubs along the river, great stop because it's warm. And there's toilets, ladies like toilets. Um, you know, and there's beer. Um, and this is the upper beer as well. This is a one, this is this section I call Kingfisher Alley because it is just full of kingfishers. Again, upper beer, wonderful little rivers. Um, they put in, this is a portage point around, around a mill. So you can see that they're quite proactive in, in putting portage points in for people um, to be able to use them. Um, this is Barton Broad itself. Uh, again, our base is up here. Um, when I was a child, I used to go here with my father in the early 60s, and I thought it was the sea. It, it was huge to me as a child. As a four-year-old in a, in a little wooden rowboat going out fishing, I thought it was the sea. When I got into canoeing, I went down there, 
and I can paddle around the whole thing in in two hours. Um, but it is it is it is magical. And you know, here's a selection of photographs that show the broads. There's no point paddling right across the middle of the broad because you don't see anything. So you work your way around the edges. You go into inlets and roads, um, you know, routes that are along the along the side. Um, but it is it is recognised as one of the best sailing um, broads in in the eastern side of the UK. Um, but it is absolutely glorious. Um, I have a reputation. I paddle early, and when I mean early in the summer, I'll be out on the on the river about five a.m. Um, <laughs> Is that the best, best time to go and I can normally be home by nine or ten in the morning um, and it is just the best time because you don't see anybody else um, I think you know with with canoeing I don't like to be lonely but I crave solitude I think it's quite a nice way that you can describe it and they always say that canoeing is about the journey and not the destination so when you can go and see beautiful scenery on your own uh, it, it's great and this is all Barton Broad and with all these little inlets that are off there you can go and explore and I'm often out there at sunrise uh, which is the best time uh, this is Sam Browning in his little chestnut um, playmate uh, we went out so we managed to get a, a, a paddle during the last lockdown socially distanced uh, I think you're always socially distanced in canoes um, but we got out Onto, onto Barton Broad. This is one of the uh, rivers linking the broads. Uh, these mills are all, uh, these ones are drainage mills. So they'll be pumping water up out of the fields into the rivers. Uh, and again, you share the river with, with some of the old you know, sailing craft and the, and the wherries that are still, still there. But this is a typical broadland scene. Uh, Hickling Broad is an, another large waterway. Um, I pick the weather for this one because it's such, it's such a huge expanse of water. If there's any wind blowing at all, um, it will be a dangerous place. So I quickly often change plans on that one. If it's looking to be a quiet uh, day weather-wise, then we'll go and do Hickling. And it is absolutely superb. Um, just going back, we, again, we'll start at a pub and at the far end there, um, there's, there's a cafe where we can um, turn around um, and the deal I do with pubs is that I have a chat with them before any, before we do anything and explain to them we'd like to park up, you know, park some cars in their car park. Um, and at the end of the, the afternoon, we'll go in there. And if I can take 20 people in there, he's quite happy to have allowed people to use his car park because he's got 20 thirsty canoeists who want to eat and drink. Um, and this is Hickling Broad. It is a huge area of water, but, but a beautiful nature reserve. Um, I used to live on the, just to the west of Cambridge, on the River Great Ouse. And the River Great Ouse, again, is navigation. Um, and with navigation, you have mills and locks. Before there were locks, at each side of the mill, there was a weir. Um, and there was always a falling out between the boatmen and the mill owners because um, for the boatmen to be able to get up from town to town, they needed water to be coming over the weir up which they could drag their, their boats. Uh, but the mill owner would want to put water through the mill and divert it away from the weir. And so what happened in the end was the boat owners said, right, we'll dig bypasses. So what you tend to find are a lot of these little routes that go round. That there's a mill there, there's a lock there. So you can see where they built these bypasses so that they didn't have to be at the bequest of the mill owner at what time or what cost they could take their goods upstream. So this means that there is this huge variation of paddling conditions. So you can come to the main river, so you can start and finish in various places and do figure of eights, um, and you don't have to worry about car shuttles because I think car shuttles take up too much of a day. Uh, and if I can avoid a car shuttle on organising a trip, I will do so. But this, this section of river is beautiful. Uh, again, this is just further west around Huntingdon and God Manchester. And again, we've got the main river here and we've got all these little backstreams here. And there's others that come up here into Hinchinbrook Park. 
little ones through here and, and these are glorious. So this is the River Great Ouse. It's a, it's a larger river than on the broads. Um, you know, wider river, it, it carries a lot of water from the middle of England across to the North Sea. Um, but it is, you know, a fantastic river. Again, this is a, and this is Houghton Mill. This is one of the mills. That mills dates from 1400 and something, if I remember rightly. Uh, and it's still milling today. Ah, I remember you're wrong. And um, this, this is one of the back streams where the, that was cut. Uh, this is the site of an old mill here, um, long gone, but um, the mill pool still remains. And these are various backwaters. This is a, uh, a <laughs> that we would mill. And again, parts of the Great Ouse. This is a God Manchester, there's a huge pool yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one, of the, one of the back streams that come up to, to the mills. Again, uh, this is Brampton Mill on the Grey Twos. And here you can go along the main river to the left here or round here. There'll always be a secondary route. So where you've got a mill, you always know there'll be a secondary stream around it because they need to divert water either through the mill or away from the mill. And there is, if you go around the back of this little boat here, and there's a couple of beautiful streams out the back there. And again, this is all the great ooze. Uh, we're fortunate we can paddle virtually all year here. Um, this was a, a, a heritage day I organized on the great ooze. You can see the ice on the edge of the river. It was a cold day. Uh, I think we were out for about three hours on that one. Um, this is another trip that um, is through Norwich. Uh, I'm not uh, adverse to doing uh, urban trips. I think they're, they're, they're quite interesting. It starts at uh, a little, um, oh, that, that, that was in the previous one. So a bit of mulled wine keeps people going on a cold day. But this is uh, the trip through Norwich. Um, you have, you know, the old factory areas. It starts at Kerry's Meadow, which is a little nature reserve where you can park. And they've been good that they've put in um, rollers for canoes to get you over fences uh, and um, you know, have start points. But it goes up through the city. Um, but there's bits of old medieval Norwich around still that you can see. And it is, it is a very nice paddle. And it's a there and back paddle because you reach the top of the navigation and you've got to turn around and come back, which is no bad thing because you see different things coming one way down the river to what you see going up the river. Um, this is another paddle. This is from Grantchester into Cambridge, Cambridge City. Uh, this section of the river here is open and free. This section is run and you have to pay to, to go on that section. Although through the um, bridge canoeing, we've done a deal with them for year on year that people can paddle it for free. Um, but again, it starts at a mill uh, and paddles into the centre of Cambridge. Now you can tell that this was a lockdown paddle because all the punts are tied up and there's no one out punting. Um, but you can go through the uh, colleges that were from Henry VIII's period. Uh, this is the Bridge of Size here. Um, and it is a lovely little river, a bit of everything for everybody there. <coughs> uh, so we've got Clare College Bridge, um, the Mill Pool at Queen's here, Bishop's Pool. Um, and you can see this, this was a couple of years ago, but the river was uh, full of punts at that time. And uh, it, it can become like a motorway at times because of the tourists. Uh, King's College Chapel there. Uh, it's quite a historic paddle through there, but uh, good fun to be able to do that. And this is the um, one of the, well, it's a fishing platform that we use to get in and out. People say to me, well, Nick, what are you doing there? Well, the, what they can't see is that my uh, buoyancy aid has got caught on a post and I dropped down. And I'm literally just hanging there um, trying to either, I can't go up and I can't go down. Um but part of the Cambridge paddle is also the fact that we go right past the best cake shop in the world, uh, which gives you great sustenance at uh, the midway of a, of a paddle. There's more sugar in there than you really want to uh, know. 
Um, this is my current home paddle. I live just up here in the forest. Um, it's 10 minutes to Brandon here where I start my trips at the moment. I used to start um, here at Thetford, down the bottom right. And we two of us would park the cars there. You'd paddle right the way through the forest here. You'd stop here for a, a breakfast and we'd finish here. Um, the great thing about that paddle, it would take four hours. There's a pub here. I would leave my paddling partner there. I would run up the road, jump on a train that would take me back to Thetford in five minutes. And then I can drive back with the car and he's just finishing his pint. Um, but now I tend to put in here and go that way or that way on there and back. So this is the start point at Brandon Bridge. Uh, this is probably one of the most beautiful rivers in the UK. Again, I, I paddle early and it is rare. I think in the last year on the number of paddles that I've been on there, I've seen two people. <laughs> so it's my river. If I see someone, I say, get off my river. You know, this is my <laughs> river. Um, it, is, it is stunning. And again, early morning. Um, it is just a beautiful little river. It's navigable. It's still navigation. That is the only boat on there. And that boat has been there for years. And the guy is slowly doing it up um, for the last 11 years. You know, he's got a bit of paint on it now. Um, it'll move one day. Uh, either down uh, or away, uh, we'll see. But uh, this is the Little Ooze. Um, I have this spot here that is my classic breakfast stop. It's probably an hour's paddling up to there. I will stop and have a break, and I'm in the middle of the forest, um, miles from anywhere, and it's just glorious. We'll see. Um, and this, again, is just the Little Ooze. This is the other side of Brandon. It's a bit wider, it's a bit flatter as we get out into the fens, which are much flatter areas. So we're out of the forest there. Um, you can see that the landscape is far more open. But we come back in, you know, the forest section is the best section, which I absolutely love. Uh, and I think you can probably see why. It is it's just one of any time of year, this is a superb river. Uh, now that is a photograph that I took this is what happens when an otter sees a, a canoeist before the canoeist sees the otter. <laughs> um, and the Little Ouse is my otter river and I absolutely love it. But if you approach an otter, that's all you'll see. If you sit still, that's what you will see because oh. the, the otters will come and see you. And I've got to know this pair of otters uh, on the Little Ouse who they, they have their territorial stretch and I can tie up and they will come and check me out. Um, and again, if you look there, up on the bank, you'll just see a doe deer just up here who's watching me. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing about being in a canoe is that they don't know what you are. You're not a human shape in a canoe. And I'm sure everybody notices when you paddle a composite canoe, which I do, they're noisy because the water slaps, but in a wood canvas canoe, it is so quiet. I could have patted those otters on their heads. You know, they just, they're not worried about me. Um, this is Scotland. Um, what can I say about Scotland? Well, it's full of Scottish people and midges. Um, Jamie Dyer, who's one of our members, he bought this Old Town HW from Sam, and he lives up in Scotland. So I picked up just on some of his um, Scottish uh, photos here. And this 18 foot HW is doing what it was meant to do, carrying a family and a load of gear uh, on, on the locks in Scotland. Mm. So great scenery up there. Got to get your timing right in Scotland because uh, if you get there in mid season, uh, you're going to be eaten alive. Like, uh, like, um, so er, early's good, or late's good. Over the summer, you're you're just a midge fest. Uh, this is the Lake District, just a bit further south, sort of northwest of England. Again, big lakes, um, 
great area but again you want to stay off the middle of the, you know i paddle in that little chestnut across windermere and it is like the sea and you're bouncing around like crazy but around the edges it is far nicer and you see more uh, graham warren who some of you would have met at um the last peterborough assembly um he paddles peterborough canoes which he builds uh, and he does epic Scottish trips uh, each year with he and his wife. Um, they will work a route out and do a lot of portaging uh, and put some really <coughs> great stories together of his trips. Um, and this is one of Graham's colleagues there up in Scotland. And, uh, you know, Graham, he's, <laughs> he's nearly got a smile like Craig Johnson, I think. Um, he might crack into one one day, but... Uh, you know, he takes his takes his group out and they, and they do their annual trip. Um, this was an interesting trip I was invited on. This was through the, tu the tunnels beneath Birmingham. And you think, well, it sounds like fun. Um, so we went, but you don't get much of a view really. <laughs> uh, the, these tunnels are a mile and a half, two miles long. Um, oh and once you've done it once, you don't really want to do it again. And it's when you're three quarters of a mile into the tunnel and the guy who's leading it says, oh, yeah, this is where it claps previously. You think, <laughs> I really want to get out of here now. Um, not many photographs, but an interesting thing to do. But when you get out the other end, that's what you'll find. Uh, you know, glorious in English countryside there. Um, and again, we talk about navigation. Um, these are examples of bridges. Right, so let's have a look at wooden canoes in the UK. Um, this is a whole selection here. We were asked to um, do a presentation paddle at the National Water Sports Centre uh, for, it was 100 years of McGregor. Um, so everything that's in that picture is a, is a wooden craft. Um, you know, there's a strip built there, cedar rib there. This is, um, Graham uh, Macareth. Graham uh, is absolutely passionate about wooden canoes. He owns Piranha and Venture Canoes. Um, this is a Rob Roy from about 1890. <coughs> so this was uh, that old town HW that Sam had got and, and restored and sold on to Jamie Dyer. Big, big canoe, 18 footer, I think that one was. Um, but paddled nicely. Yeah, very nice paddle. Uh, this is Jonathan Furbank's um, Indian Girl, uh, probably the most expensive um, wooden canoe in the UK because he came, he went over to the States and built it at Rolling Thurlow's shop and then bought it home. So he would have paid for the, the cost of making it at one of Rollins' courses and then bringing it back into the UK. Um, lovely canoe. Again, that photo would not go down well because Jonathan doesn't believe in wearing a buoyancy aid. Um, this is uh, David Millwood's Old Town Octa. Octa. Um, and again, Dave doesn't like wearing a buoyancy aid, but you all know Dave. Um, Dave also has this yeah, we always laugh that he stern paddles all the time, sits and paddles from the stern seat. Um, both of these are David's canoes. Um, yeah, I don't think David might, I think he's 76 now, but he loves huge canoes. So the one on the left, the, the white and red one, is his Stevenson's rib canoe that's got a canvas covering on it. Um, David paid, a, he, he offered 10 shillings for that, which is 50 pence back in 1960. He ended up paying a pound for it. Mm -hmm. um, this one here, he paid a bit more for, but he waited, I think, about 30 years to buy that. Um, but you can see he, he likes to paddle from the back. And it, he, he has put a little bit of uh, uh, ballast in the front there. But normally you'll see David paddling. And you know it's David because the front of the canoe is about three foot out of, out of the water. <laughs> uh, then we got the Peterborough style canoes. Um, <coughs> on the left there is, that's a wide board and back, back and canoe, my cedar rib in the middle, and then Alec, um, but he makes Peterborough canoes, and that's his, his modern Peterborough. 
Um, this is Graham Macareth with that Rob Roy. Um, beautiful little canoe. Let's say Graham is absolutely passionate about it. And you always know that if you've got a, a wide board and band, you're going to need a sponge. Uh, and um, in, yeah, Sam, this day we went out, Sam was busy with his sponge. And in the end, we said, look, just stop and keep emptying it. It was quicker. So we'd take him over the side and we'd tip it all out. Uh, this is a, um, a modern uh, wood canoe. It's, um, it's, it's a cedar wood canoe built over in Wales, um, just a, a strip canoe with, with epoxy outside, uh, as is this. This is what Alec builds um, as his bread and butter things. This is a little dab chick um, canoe, uh, which is you know, very popular. And it's quite interesting that you put two canoes next door to each other, that one and, and that one, that's the, a wood canvas and that's a, 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 a stripper with epoxy. People go for this all the time. They will always go and look at this because they say, well, is that covered in plastic? Uh, and you have to, ex you have to explain, um, it's hard work explaining about wood canvas canoes to people that they don't believe that it's canvas that's painted. Yeah. Um, that's a Canadian canoe. Uh, company one, beautiful one. There's a sailing, two mile sailing rig uh, on that one, owned by Paul Lister. Uh, another um, cedar rib. Um, this one's uh, owned um, by someone in London. What I don't like about it is, I don't know if you can see, but they, to strengthen it, they put clunky big in whales on it, which it shouldn't have. Um, and so you, you've got probably an inch and a quarter square in whale on that. It just takes away from the fine lines of the canoe. Uh, I was given this one. Uh, I got a call. Uh, Annie put me in. Annie Burke put me in touch with someone in the UK. Who's, uh, they said, "Look, we just—it was Dad's canoe. Would you like it?" So it was—it was a barn find, as you can see. It's got more pigeon poop on it than anything. Um, we put it on the car, and the woman said, "Look, I just want it to to go to someone who will restore it. Don't want anything for it." So I had a candidate in mind, so I gave it to Alec, who um, needed to get his knees wet in a proper wooden canoe rather than a glass fiber covered one. Uh, we put it on the car and drove home. It was a different car when we, um, canoe when we got home because it rained. Um, we found this nameplate on the front. Uh, it's Thomas Gordon. Uh, so I gave it to Alec and he sorted it all out. And... That is it when it when it's been uh, mm. up and done. Uh, beautiful canoe, um, and there's there's another one. Graham Macareth owns that one. That's a Thomas Gordon as well. Um, so uh, there's three that I know of in the UK, but there'll be more because they're always tucked away in boat houses. Uh, we had a French invasion. Uh, these are all French canoes. Um, this was a pre-Brexit uh, trip that they did across to the Thames Traditional. Uh, the French love their wooden canoes. <coughs> um, this is uh, a Jerry Stelmock canoe that we found up in the Midlands. Uh, Sam restored it. Uh, I think it's a guide. I'm not too sure. Um, this is another one I was given. Someone said, would you rehome this? So Alan, who's paddling it, um, took it over. Uh, it's got got lovely shape to it. We don't know what it is, um, but it's uh, a very nice looking canoe. Um, wide. Um, I think on, we, we had a meeting and we took, whilst he wasn't there, we took his centre thwart out and we poured it in two inches and it suddenly looked a lot better. And we put the cut the thwart and put it back in and he didn't know, but he said it paddled better. So, uh, uh, and then we have this beastie. Um, this is a 12 seater. Uh, Chestnut Ogilvy. On this trip, we only agreed to portage it once. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, and Sam said, well, I have a slight dilemma when I'm trying to transport it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a two-parter. It splits, to, it actually splits down the middle. Oh my gosh. Um, and this, again, is that, that what we, we call it a UFO. We just don't know what it is. Uh, and then this is Andy Gullen's uh, little canoe. It's a, a, a Huron, uh, only a little 12 footer, but a nice, nice little canoe goes well. Uh, 
Um, for, for the German contingent, this is Frank Munker, who live, who's you know German paddler, one of the top freestyle paddlers in, in Germany. Mm. Uh, and he loves to paddle at, uh, that's a Loon Works Nakoma, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a lovely little canoe. Um, that's Charles Burchill paddling um, one of Jerry's uh, Millennium canoes mm. that he did. Uh, that, that's owned by Jörg Wagner in Germany. Um, this is, uh, Thomas Braun makes these ones in Germany, the, uh, wood canvas canoes. <laughs> Love, lovely canoe, good quality, great quality work that he does. And this is Luther Kruck uh, from Holland who's paddling this. Uh, he again is an American freestyle uh, instructor. The, the American freestyle and freestyle canoe is huge in Germany. Germany and Holland, very popular. Again, that's that's Frank uh, in that canoe. I found this Morris um, down on the Thames. Um, I don't know if you can see, but someone did a topside backside repair on this one. Uh, you can just see here. Uh, obviously, didn't want to upset the planking, so he did the uh, backside repairs inside. Um, oh, I'll just come back to that. Um, but lovely canoe, lovely shape on that canoe. Um, and then we, we've got, uh, this is a new birch bark that um, Edward, who I met, um, this guy here, he is a shipwright. And what he started to do was to say, right, if you want to come down to the south coast of England and build a birch bark canoe, he was going across to Ottawa uh, would meet up with Pinnock Smith up there. They would go and collect all the materials, bring them back to the UK. Pinnock would come over, and with Pinnock and Edward, you would build your own birch bark canoe. The downside is that there's four transatlantic flights in, in the cost of it, yeah. plus all the materials. So I'd hate to think how much, and I suspect he probably didn't have any takers because it would be hellishly expensive to do that. Um, this is one of John Wilkinson's canoes. John, John runs a company called Valkyrie Craft in Northern Ireland um, and does wooden canvas canoes and is also working on more Jeez. modern finishes that he started um, doing a lot of skin on frame. He does a lot of Greenland kayaks but makes a very nice oh, canoe. Sure. There's quite a few of his wood canvas canoes around the UK. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. This is Sam Browning. Um, Sam is Sam B on the main website. Sam is uh, my mentor really he lives up the road from me here. We've been friends for years. Uh, he was a technology teacher at a college and just loves building canoes. So he built that Chi Man. Um, Edward Lines with his strip built canoe. Again, you can see he's a Thames paddler because he paddles the same way David Millwood does. He sits right at the back and has the bow out of the water. Um, and the reason I say that is that the majority of us, Neil, you know, very few people in the UK paddles sitting on the on the seats uh yeah i always kneel people think you're drunk when you get out because you can't walk because your legs have gone dead uh, <laughs> sailing now i love sailing i know benson i think benson's hanging in here somewhere um you know you, you know why paddle when you can sail um so that's my cedar rib with with the rig that you know i put back on it and given the opportunity i will take her out sailing whenever i can um this, this was this one here you, you, if you look at my stance you can see I'm braced because that, that was a fair blow coming across there and I was out with some guys in um, quite high tech um, sailing canoes and they were struggling to keep up with me um, I was hanging on for grim life really um, and we, we were motion because the cedar rib canoes are like an eggshell on the water, really. Uh, they had all their outriggers, um, which adds more drag. Um, and I, I love sailing that canoe, it is great fun. Um, and Dan Miller had sold me these when I went to the assembly at John Smith's, you know, a, a contemporary pair of lee boards for it. But you don't need, it's a leisure sailing canoe rather than a hardcore sailing canoe. You don't need a lot of wind to sail that canoe nicely. And that um, uh, Jerry Stelmuck canoe that we saw earlier, 
here it is here. This is an open canoe sailing day. Uh, and there it is amongst all the uh, plastic canoes there, uh, ready to go with a rig on it. This is my current uh, paddle. Um, I coveted this canoe for years whilst it was being built. Um, it's a Chestnut Pal. Uh, it was built by a friend of mine, Peter Robinson, to Alex Combs design of Stuart River. Every single bit of that canoe came from the US. It was imported into the UK. You, you know, the, every bit of lumber on it, every, every nut, bolt, the only thing that didn't was the paint. Um, and, you know, Peter just loves building canoes. He's a professor of dentistry at one of the universities. So that's his workshop. Um, I, when I went to visit him, I took my shoes off to go in that workshop. <laughs> Um, you know, that's work in progress there, believe it or not. And, uh, but he, he offered me the canoe earlier this, uh, earlier in 2020. He said, Nick, you know, I've got too many canoes. There's only one person I'd like to sell it to and that's you. So I was quite happy to take it. And it is a beautiful canoe. Um, and it's a 16 footer. For me, it, it, it's better. The first canoe I had was a little 14 foot chestnut playmate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm built for luxury and not for speed in terms of my size. And a 14 footer is, is too small for me. Um, and you'll see in some of the photographs that the people always say to me, oh, Nick, your trim's off. Uh, and in a 14 footer it would be, but in a, a 16 footer, it works well. Um, so that, that was my first canoe that I had, just little chestnut playmate. I did what most people do with them, converted it from uh, a 14 foot tandem to a solo. Um, I found it in the Southwest of England and all I did was put a lick of paint on it and change the seating arrangement. Uh, it, it served me well, but I, I was always too big for it or it was too small for me. I don't know whichever way you want to approach that. Um, you know, being delicate, uh, you know, you'd sit a dog in the front and that might level it up, but a Labrador never stays in a canoe for that long. Um, oh, where are we? Sorry, I've just, let me just go back to where we were on the... Right. So this was uh, my, my first entry into sorting canoes out was to re-canvas the chestnut because it leaked. Uh, it had a, had a shoe keel on it and that's where it leaked. So um, I whipped the canvas off and put a canvas back on it and then redid it all and that was the end result. A bit flashy for a chestnut, um, but, but I like red and white, you know. Um, this was the other one that I had. Um, I still have my um, cedar rib that you would have seen in one of the latest editions of the Wooden Canoe magazine. Um, Again, I was offered that. I think I paid 700 pounds for it. And it was the gift that kept giving when I met a guy who was selling it because he gave me all the sailing gear, the trolleys, the seats and everything that came with it. But then occasionally things happen. Um, that's from not securing the roof rack on the car. And you sit there and you think, oh, what am I gonna do? And um, I just had a good look at it and, and you work it out. And the reason it had gone was because the outwhale was completely worm ridden. When I'd first done it up, I hadn't really, you know, I, I did a little bit of repair. You, and what I'd always say to anybody, if you see a few worm holes on the outside, that's not an indicator of what's going on in the inside because it was like powder. Had the gunnels you know, been good on that, it would have withstood the, the drop. Um, but I looked at it and thought, right, okay, nothing had, you know, the outwells had snapped, but the planking, you can see the, you can see the split down here. It was still hanging on. It was still hanging. And what's happened here is the tongue and groove have pulled out. So what I ended up doing was saying, right, let's uh, take this off completely. And then I relaxed, I hogged the canoe, if that makes sense. So I let it, I let the ends drop, pulled this wider 
squeezed it in, introduced a little bit of uh, West's G-Flex epoxy just to help strengthen that joint and then pulled it back up. I pulled the ends back up. Um, that's how it was and that's how it ended up. Um, I put new outwales on it um, and the damage was here. And that, you know, so you can salvage things. And uh, it's one of the, the, the uh, one of the stringers here had snapped. So we just put a little brace alongside of that. But, you know, this is a 1900 yeah, canoe. Um, I, I like to repair and have usable canoes. It, you know, there is this difference between repair and restoration as to how far you go. It had been repaired before. They just whacked a copper plate on it. That was the only bit of the canoe that doesn't leak, actually. Um, this is my latest ride. I was given this one. Um, in fact, I was, you know, the guy begged me to take it away. Um, 1911 Old Town, Charles River, which you would have seen, you know, I'm blogging it on the, on the main website and also on the Facebook page. Um, I think I looked earlier, I think there's 5,000 views on it to date. So it's, I'm either doing something dreadfully wrong or something right that people are interested. Some people are telling me that I'm doing things terribly wrong and I'm getting private messages and I've, but you know, we, 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 we're getting there. It was covered in glass fiber. Uh, it had been dropped and you can see there were eight broken ribs there. So I did a mixture, you know, and, I've never done anything like this before, so I was learning. Um, so I did some backside repairs on, on the ones that I think could do, because my aim was to try and restore and retain as much of the original canoe as I could. Um, I learned to steam bend stuff, and that's an art, isn't it? Um, what I think I ended up, we wanted it six out of eight, so I broke two, you know. So not a, not a bad, not a bad rate. And, and the problem here that we have in the UK is getting the right sort of timber because you know it's very difficult, uh, particularly during the lockdown, you couldn't go and select what you wanted, you took what you were given. And so, you know, I had to grab hold of uh, what cedar I could get. Um, and there's four new ribs in there and I'm quite happy with that. You know, I put four in there and I can't, I can't even tell which ones they are now. Um, bending the, the uh, outer stems, that's a bit of an art, isn't it? You've got to be brave, steam it for longer than you think and just keep going. Um, it went all the way around. There was a little tiny crack here where the grain ran out, but you know, we can, we can deal with that. And then you have to become inventive on how you put stuff on. Um, ratchet straps are great you know you've got the basic shape but wood always relaxes um, I learned to cane you know never done caning in my life before so I thought right I'll have a go um, you know over a couple of evenings you, you get them done uh, this caused some interesting debate on the Facebook page this is what we use to uh, fill the canoes uh, it's the basement water paint, waterproofing paint um, it has, uh, it resists mold because it, it, it's got a biocide in it. Um, and what you do, you stipple it into the weave. Uh, it dries in about seven hours. Uh, you lightly rub it off and you put the second coat on. Um, and you know, I did the chestnut in it five years ago and that's good. Other canoes that have been done even longer ago. It, it's easy to use. Um, you know, people have had you know, suggestions that it's not traditional. Well, it's not traditional, but things move on. You know, it, I hear of so many people who, who can't quite get their mix right. And John Wilkinson up in Northern Ireland, he had canoes that he had used traditional filler recipes and they just wouldn't go off. And a lot of that was, I think, down to the humidity. Um, and he started using this and said it's, it has transformed how he can build his canoes. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, it's not to everybody's taste, but, you know, life changes and, and I'm, I'm sure that if these were available 100 years ago, people would have used, used it. Um, 
So I'm not quite finished. You know, I've got the shape back. I think I think it's you know the shape is looking good. Um, I'm currently up to two two coats of uh, paint at the moment. Um, I'm busy at the moment. I'm still working out. So Benson will probably recognise these. I'm busy cutting templates um, to start doing uh, pattern 22, I think it is, which again is not quite, you know, it's a bit later than the age of the canoe, but it's my canoe and I'll paint it what colour I like and put what pattern I like on it. Um, it, it it's been an interesting exercise doing this because I have, have private messages for people telling me, I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing this, but do you know what? I'm fixing it. And I think everybody should have a go. Um, you know, I've got a hammer. I can fix anything with a hammer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a learning curve. I've asked people and that's what you've just got to share your knowledge. And that's why I blog it step by step so that people can say, well, if this English guy can restore, you know, this canoe and repair this canoe in a garage, that's only a 10 inches longer than the canoe, um, I can do it. And I, I think, you know, and that's what we have to do is people shouldn't be scared of, of, of these canoes. And it's an interesting exercise. Um, here's, this is Sam. Um, Sam loves canoes and he found this. This is a Rushton uh, Navajo. Uh, he oh, was boy. doing a cedar rib canoe up for someone. And he said, what's that hanging on the wall? She said, well, it's not mine, it's someone else's. He said, oh, I'd love that canoe. And he managed to buy it um, about 1910. And this, you know, he picked it up and we whacked a bit of tape on it and we took it for a paddle. Um, and there it is with my, with my rib canoe there. Um, but six, 16 footer. And, you know, this is how it came, came to him. That's how it is now. Um, he's redone the seats, redone the rails, and he too is waiting for his paint to harden. Uh, so I think we'll have a joint launch day. Um, this is our main group. This, this is uh, when we were whipping out that thwart on that uh, UFO canoe and we, we, we cranked the canoe in by a couple of inches. Um, and that is me done. All right. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, a little Nick. bit of a broad spectrum there, but yeah. uh, I did not see a lot of messages coming through on the chat. So I think now we just open it up to real time questions and answers. Um, so I thought that maybe um, Craig. Uh, Johnson would be on here because I thought he had told me he has some questions for you, but I see he wasn't able to join us today. Um, so I, I I have some questions if nobody else does. <laughs> so yes, I, sure. I have one. Sure, Jean. Um, I noticed you paddle up and back on most of the rivers. How much current is in there? Because our people don't like paddling up current. Well, That's yeah, what's it? Question, what's it? <laughs> uh, it's not too bad. You, on, you, what you've got to work out is the tide times because some of those waters are, are tidal, even oh, yeah, you know, yes, 30 yes. miles from the sea. Um, but, you know, I would have been paddling today had we not had rain this week. Uh, the rivers at the moment here are charging through. Um, so you can, they're normally not that great. You know, we're flat. We're not, you're not paddling uphill at any stage. Um, and it, you, can, you can cope with it. Or yeah. if, if there is a current, you just creep up the edges. You eddy hop. Okay. Anybody else? I just wanted to say great job, Nick, both on the canoe and on the presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you, Benson. And thank you for your help. I'll um, second that. <laughs> you know, on, a, on, a, on, a, on advice, you know, I, I have had a lot of flack, I would say, from stateside over what I'm doing to the old town. Well, I tell them to get over it. <laughs> yeah, well, I have done. I have done. I, you know, I, I always try to maintain, as you've suggested, it's your canoe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Follows, so. yeah. If I want to put carry handles on it to make life easier, I'll put carry handles on it. 
I, I was curious about what you call, we call these th things life jackets, we call them a PFD, you called it something else. Yeah, we call it a buoyancy aid. A buoyancy, um, a buoyancy aid. Yes, a buoyancy. A buoyancy. Yeah. A buoyancy. Oh, a buoyancy aid. Ah, okay. yeah. got it, got it, okay. Uh, I, I come out of a scouting association background and a life jacket will float you up so that your face is out of the water, a buoyancy aid won't. So we do, we differentiate between the two. Oh. Yeah, those in the U <clears throat> in the U.S. those are designated as classes. Yeah, yeah classes. Yeah, class classes or types one through five, I think it is. I had another I question remember. about terminology. You you kept saying about a stave. Is that what I would call a launch uh, or a, a, a launch? A yeah, it's the village stave. Yeah, it is. It it is just those those areas that you saw where right at the start of the presentation where you saw the mooring poles mm -hmm. and the canoe tied up. They're, they're called staves. And stave, each village okay. would have had a stave that um, goods would have come to and from. It, it all hankers back to the medieval period. Um, yeah. And it is, you know, I, I've sat on, on local authorities for the waterways to represent canoeing and trying to negotiate access to those staves with some of the villagers I've, I've driven up with a canoe on the roof of the car and got out of the car and I've had people run up, you can't canoe from here. I said, I'm not going to, I'm just having a look. Oh, um, wow. And I, I do believe, you know, I say to people, use it or lose it. Um, there are some states that we can use. Uh, there's some states you can stop at and get out, but you can't lift your boat out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I continue to say to people, do that because um, otherwise you will lose that right You're by prescription. Right. Yeah. You have we to have, keep, have that problem keep everything with some, going by prescription. With some bike trails around around Pittsburgh, we have yeah. some issues. We are we are, we are two nations separated by a common language, you realize. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> now there was something else I had on my my list here. What was it? No, it wasn't about birch barks. Oh, midges. The midges are midges. little black flies, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, They're smaller. Yeah, midges. Yeah, there's two bad things about Scotland. One's the Scottish people and the other are midges. <laughs> but that's, that's coming from an Englishman. Because I always say to my Scottish friends, I say, Scotland's such a nice place. Why are you down here? Uh, yeah, I think they get independent soon though, right? Yeah. But, it's, but it's the same with French, English French, you know, it goes back to Ashencourt and, you know. Okay. Nick, I'd like to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. Absolutely great. Wonderful. I have a question. Um, the term you keep saying it's navigation. Explain yeah. what that means to you. Um, right. So navigation goes back to the Magna Carta. Do you know about the Magna yeah. Carta? Right. <laughs> yeah. It goes right back then. And if we can prove that there has been navigation, i.e., people where you've got a, a mill. And, and people have had to go past that mill in a boat, historically, then there's a right of navigation. Hmm. If we can continue to prove right of navigation, then I'm entitled to go there. What's happened over the years is a lot of those mills have been converted to really nice houses mm -hmm. and people don't want crabby canoeists dragging their canoe across their beautifully manicured lawn to get back into the river above the mill but there's a right of navigation. So we are entitled to do so. Yeah. And currently that's, there's a lot of legislation being pushed through mm -hmm. to enable that map to turn greener in England and Wales to match how it was in Scotland. Because Scotland has this right to roam. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go anywhere you like in Scotland. Uh, you can even paddle through the Queen's estate at Balmoral. See some good things about Scotland. Yeah, you did yeah, say yeah, something yeah. good about yeah, Scotland. Whiskey, whiskey. <laughs> whiskey. I'll drink to that. <laughs> exactly. It's Betsy, Betsy and Jim Wilson here. We uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Lots of beautiful photographs. And I think we saw some past. And I had none images. in the calendar this year. And so <laughs> I think we saw some future calendar images. So great mm -hmm. images, and uh, we were thinking you should put together a trip where we could come visit and paddle some of these wonderful waterways. Well, what I was going to say is, 
here is my my reading list was this mm -hmm. for my restoration uh, this which i won at the assembly in peterborough can you read that yeah. Mandy? Ring of fire. Fire. okay yeah. ring of fire this one john jennings fantastic I book. I but this is the best one uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Only the English would produce this. We would love to try it. <laughs> oh, I'll bet if you I'll gave him a date, Betsy, he'd figure it out. <laughs> got it. Well, we, can, we can do a trip along the Thames because, yes. um, you know, going back to the thing about navigation, is that for navigation, they built the mills, they, they built locks and they had to have the workers who were the navvies who were mostly irish the water quality when they were doing it was abysmal so they had to feed and water them so what they did was gave them ale oh, beer yeah. mm -hmm. so that's why at most locks you'll have an ale house <laughs> i would vote for an ice cream shop yeah but, well <laughs> Hands up for beer. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I read somewhere that the average navvy in a day would drink about 16 pints. Oh, I've not known an American who can get past two pints of English beer yet. <laughs> they were well hydrated. <laughs> and still get in where you want to go. Still so they kept the locks filled. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because most... Most canals are dead straight, but there's one in Kent that goes like that. And you think, well, that, they must have had too much beer there. So I see that Pam has her hand up. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Oh, maybe she's just waving. I want to say that we had oh, a- no. Oh, no, no. I, I was, I was uh, being uh, positive about the beer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we had I a thought, nice I international thought. crowd today, because Pam, are you in Canada? Yep. Yep, yeah, and, my, and my daughter's in Germany, and then we have Nick from Britain, and then the rest of we Yanks over here trying to figure out what we're well, horrible doing. minute. I thought Pam was going to tell me off about the paint finish on my boat. <laughs> oh, good God, Pam. no. <laughs> plastic okay. paint. I don't know. I, I'd like to learn more about that plastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Jane. Hi. <laughs> it's Great sort of like the gorilla tape of, of canoe building, right? Yeah, I think so. Dries faster than mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. No, it's it, 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 and it's an American product. Yeah, figures. It's in Zinza. It's Zinza. Zinza sounds sure. Zinza, Zinza water oh. time. It's an Zinza. American product. Right. That's pretty much a monopoly on shellac. So, do we have any more questions for Nick or any comments? I have a question. Going back to the tunnels under Birmingham, was the paddle wheeler specific to getting through those narrow tunnels? Right. Uh, now, Alec, right, so that was Alec who builds those strip canoes. He's a bit of a, um, I'm calling him a Heath Robinson. Heath Robinson was this mad inventor in the UK donkeys years ago who were like making Goldberg. Contractions. So Alec's canoes in his, in his workshop uh, go uh, up to the rafters on water lifts. He's made water lifts to lift his canoes up. So he has tubs of water that fill up and raise it up on pulleys. Uh, so he knew we were going through the tunnels. So what he did was made this water wheel that clipped into the scuppers on the side of his wooden canoe. Oh yeah, I saw that in the it, picture. Yeah. Yeah. It was connected to his head torch so that as he paddled, it charged his head torch. <laughs> oh, for crap. <laughs> you know. The headlight. I would just buy another battery. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> or engineers in the crowd, huh? Oh dear. So nice to see everybody. Yeah. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Nice to see awesome. anybody. Awesome. We've been sad to not be on the water, and we've done some shorter um just club Zoom meetings. But this one, since since we had roped Nick in, we figured it was important to open it up to a to a bigger group, and I'm glad we did today. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. And I think well, it worked well, out. Thanks, well. Thanks, is um, if you know we've got a wooden canoe heritage Facebook page that a lot happens on there. Um, you have to ask to join it. Uh, do join it um, and add add comments because I say to people it's all always about sharing information. Right, right. Um, and you know, particularly over here, 
our biggest problem is getting hold of materials. As I say, that PAL that I've got, if you imagine every single bit of that came from the, the US. I don't uh, understand how you can act. I mean, it must be hard to import it anyway, because wouldn't it have to be sprayed and to make sure there's no bugs on it? Yeah. And no, because it was milled before it came in, it was below a, the, a certain <laughs> thickness. Um, sure. If it's below a certain thickness, then it doesn't have to be, because I, oh, I watched okay. David Millwood smuggle a whole load of rib stock onto a British Airways flight oh, uh, a few okay. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. It All was right. rather like something from Colditz. I think he had it stuffed up his trouser leg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the biggest distinction in moving lumber across borders like that is whether it has bark on it or not. If yeah. it's milled lumber, it's easier to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. If it's got bark on it, then you're out of luck in a lot yeah, of ways. What a challenge! I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't like to try. You know, even the the dolphinite filler came across. How you get that through customs, I do not know. Mm. I was surprised you could get birch bark across. Uh, yeah, well, I was too because yeah. that bark. Well, he didn't <laughs> do it though, right? He was going to do it, but it didn't happen. Is that right? No, no he built that that canoe, that oh. birch bark that you saw. Yeah. Um, he went across to Ottawa Pinnock Smith. They, they, they cut all the birch bark uh, and bought all the cedar back as well. So Ooh. he must have filled a lot of forms out, I would think. <laughs> bring that in. Go on. Yeah, it's, it's scary, you know. Unfortunately, I'm trying to get a GoPro camera battery from Holland at the moment, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and that, that's just 20 miles away across the water. Yeah, oh, yeah. There are no cedar trees in Germany or? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But not, they're, they're not proper ones. Not the right oh. kind. Mm. Chad you know, from the I, I of went Robin to my lumber yard and said, I'd like, uh, I'd like some, nor was it Northern White Cedar? Right. <laughs> he looked at me and said, well, what's that? You know, is it lime? Is it, I don't know. So, uh, you know, every, everything I, you know, I managed to get hold of some Western Red Cedar. Uh, for the, 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 the outwales on, on the old town, I specifically wanted Brazilian mahogany because that's what they were originally. Um, because, of, because of the CITES arrangement, trying to get hold of Brazilian mahogany now is taboo because mm -hmm. you, you, it's yeah. like ivory, you can't. So I went to my local lum lumber yard and said, I, this is what I want. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. And then he phoned me up on the QT and said, I've got some. Oh. Um, <laughs> is it for a restoration? And this is the crucial thing. I, I said, yes. He said, I can sell it to you for a restoration. I cannot sell it to you for a new build. Ah. Uh -huh. um, because it had been cut by his grandfather and milled 50 years ago before mm -hmm. CITES came into existence. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so you can use older woods for restoration but not for new builds. So you have to end up going with Sapili or something, um, you know, that, 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 that is more sustainable. Um, but, you know, I thought I, I, I might call my uh, old town impeachment. I might name it impeachment. I think we quite good. We're not gonna go there. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. I think, you know, people who are into canoes, um, we're a different breed. Um, <laughs> we've got a head screwed on right. Yeah. Um, I say, I use the expression, I, you know, I, I crave to go out in my canoe and I, I like, you know, the solitary existence on the river, but I'm not a lonely person, if that makes sense. Well, you've just got such wonderful waterways, and I keep looking for canoes whenever I go visit my daughter and my grandkids in Germany, and only once have I seen what they call a Canadian on top of a, on top of a, uh, a van, and I think one time we were hiking, and way down in the distance there was a lake, and there were about four canoes there, but yeah. I, I'm just amazed that you've dug up all those wooden canoes in Britain, and, oh, and now well, well, I, I what guess... Happened was you see, if you think about it, in the late Victorian and Edwardian era, recreation, it, it wasn't football, it, you know, there was, uh, and on the, in the Thames from London up to Oxford on the River Thames, you, you could walk across the, 
um, river on wooden canoes. There were so oh, many. There, there were so fleets. Many. Yeah, yeah. And what's happening nowadays is that they're all stored in attics of boat of boat houses. Um, and I know in the Lake District, there's another cedar rib that's just sitting there drying out. And I'm oh. desperate to get my hands on it. Yeah, before it um, comes, yeah. And like the Navajo that Sam found, that was that had been not touched for 30 years or more. Mm -hmm. The the Thomas Gordon, 37 years in a barn. Yeah. Um, well, like so there, are, yeah. there are loads of them along the waterways. Um, you just got to find them and prize them out. All right, I have to tell my grandchildren down there in the corner, you have to start hunting those canoes in Germany. Yeah, Holland, <laughs> a yeah, big movement in Holland. You know, uh, the Dutch um, have a lovely canoe festival. Um, they're yeah. they're not that far away and they could go to that Kringle finger thing, but <laughs> it's just that Kringle little bit far away. We <laughs> almost got there a couple of years ago. Uh, <laughs> the Kringle fever means squiggly line. That's what it means. My 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 Deutsch is great. <laughs> yeah. uh, Billy, look for one of mine in Germany. There's okay. one there somewhere. Right there. All right, all right. Tell What's it called, Al? The Bismarck. Yeah, I I, I did it's I did named. down to the boathouse down in Karlsruhe, down by the Rhine, and I think there was one wood canvas canoe there, but it was huge. It was one yeah, well, my, the one of mine that's there is an 18 foot stripper. Oh, okay. No, I didn't see that one. So that's not in Karlsruhe. It was, yeah. I knew an 18 foot stripper in Carlsberg, but uh, it wasn't the same thing, Al. There are children here. <laughs> All right. Well, are, so are we, any other questions? We, we've we been recording this. I don't know what we're going to do with the recording, but I, I have it. I'm going to put it on a hard drive. I guess if anybody was seriously interested in it, I could maybe post it on a Dropbox or something. Uh, Anyway, Millie, what, like, this what, is, what, Millie, Pete Shea from, this is Pete. Um, I'd love to get a copy of it and share it with my chapter if we can. Is that all right with you, Nick? More than happy. Okay. All yeah, right. I would, I'd like one too when we get, when you get to doing it. Okay. All right. Well, Peter, you're going to have Millie? to tell me your email. Um, I think I have to, if I use Dropbox, I think I have to have your email address and right. you have like a week or something to pull it off out of the Dropbox. Okay. Unless you have yeah. a better way to exchange it. If you want to give me a copy through Dropbox, I can put it up on a private part of, the, of a website and you oh. can link to anybody okay. who wants it. Okay, guess I won't need to struggle with passwords or usernames or anything else. Okay, the, this, the hard drive is what I put it on because they tend to be pretty big, pretty big files, but I'll just put up the, the video. I think that'll, that you, you don't want just the audio, but the video, we'll try it anyway, Benson. Can, can I just ask Benson something? Sure. Um, what is the paint job on that first canoe I see hanging on your ceiling? This one? Yeah. I know what it is. This is a green one. This one, they're two eight foot models. And oh, right. okay. One for something that they called the canoe hullabaloo in Old Town many years ago, where they oh. had a bunch of different canoes that were painted and decorated. And this one has a series of catalogs all around it, and then other images filled in over it. And uh, my wife and I made it a project, and uh, so we've hung on to it. Unfortunately, okay aged well it's it's starting to uh, peel a little bit in places but uh, but that's what it is okay well my headache at the moment is working out the, the um, pattern 22 <laughs> working the masking out and you, which way to go first you know you 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 have my sympathies that's not <laughs> <laughs> okay well I'm gonna stop the recording pretty soon but I will be uh, working with Benson to try to get the um, recording onto a private spot in the on the website or on the server someplace. And so if we just stay in touch with him, we'll find out whether it works and, and how you can pull it off. Wonderful. Yeah, there, I can, Thank I you. can help you through that. Okay, so, all right, bye Nick, everybody. Thank you, bye. 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 Thank you Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Dennis, Thank you. Nick, or Nick. Thanks everybody, nice. fun. Bye. Good to see you all. Thank you. I'm shutting us down. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.